Off the Wall Productions is proud to present Voices of the Methow. This is a series of conversations with interesting folk in and around the valley. This is Art Zink. Here's a story about my great aunt Mary. She was a farmer all of her life. I swear she may have been in a cornfield when she was fresh out of the crib. The most significant person in my very young life was a great aunt who lived just across the pasture and tree plot from us, who in fact had sold my father a lot at the corner of her field, upon which he built a small house that was home until I was five. She may well have been more significant than my mother, who was usually ill, or my father, who worked the incredible long hours that young men use to define themselves as ambitious and good providers. She was my favorite relative on either side, my mother's favorite aunt, my father's favorite in-law. She was, I believe, everyone's favorite old person, whatever the relationship, and everyone called her simply Aunt Mary. As the sun sags closer to the curve of the earth in mid-December, Daylight across the northern tier of states ebbs to about eight hours. The low southern sun casts long shadows even through the middle of the day, as if the world lives in perpetual afternoon. If the sky is clear after sunset, any meager warmth that has been stored drains rapidly to the heat sink of space, and the stars ride out into a night emptied of life. Now the north wind carries the vestigial memory of the glacial snows. If it comes out of the east, it is raw. Out of the west, it is a gale. And from the south, it brings rain that is ice on the flesh. People grow old in December. Aunt Mary sat between me in the winter afternoon outside the window. Eyes glazed, head bowed, she mumbled the Our Fathers, Hail Marys, and Glory Bees of her rosary and an incoherent stream of lip movements as her gnarled old fingers shuffled along the beads. She was on the last set of ten now. It was Friday. That would make it the fifth sorrowful mystery, the crucifixion. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. I was only six, and I could already say the whole rosary with my eyes closed and thinking about something else. Aunt Mary was seventy-five. I was sure she never thought about anything else. Eternal risk got unto them, O Lord. The sun's rays reached nearly across the room from the high, narrow window, and I squinted one eye to better focus on the dust motes that swirled through the golden beam and let perpetual light shine upon them. Where the shaft of light passed over a warm air register in the floor, a maelstrom of activity was hurling the dust particles into invisible shadow. And may their souls and all the souls of the faithful depart. The mercy of God rest in peace. A maple branch was nudging darkly at the edge of the light as the sun began to drift behind it. Amen. Aunt Mary had moved only her head, raising it slightly to look out at the snow and the winter black trees and the dying sun that smiled so sweetly from so very far away. She was seeing one more spring, one more warm rain and green fields, One more planting. She was seeing the work and the worry, the pain and the promise, the enduring which made her farmer's life possible. She turned slowly and smiled at me, sitting there in the warm air vent with my comic book and pretzels, and then got up, put on her five-buckle arctics, ragged old woolen coat, and went outside. She would be in after feeding the stock, cleaning the stalls, milking and picking up the eggs. She would live to see not one, but ten more springs. Perhaps it was working the 80-acre farm by herself that did it, or perhaps it was our father's and Hail Mary's. Living just across the creek from her, Aunt Mary was only a couple hundred yards and two generations away from our young family and middle-class American farm life of the 40s. She had been the daughter of a farmer herself, used to long hours and short appreciation for her days in the fields. She was an 18-year-old girl when one Saturday afternoon, a wealthy farmer from the neighboring township had stopped his buggy and watched Aunt Mary and her sister 
help with the haying. It was heavy, dusty work, and the man watched it all until the wagons were hauled in at dark. He was there again the next Saturday while they pulled suckers from the knee-high corn and the steaming July heat. This time he stopped at the house and talked for a long time with her parents, Mr. and Mrs. Wickenheiser. The third Saturday he did not come, but the girls were called in from the fields early in the afternoon and told to wash and dress up. Just before supper, the two sons of the old German who had watched them arrived in stiff white collars, capped by equally white stiff faces. Their names were Ferdinand and Edwin. They had been expected for supper, and Ferdinand was to sit next to Mary, Edwin next to her sister Teresa. Not much was left to chance or option. Grandpa Fix was quite specific. The two brothers married the two sisters late the next autumn after harvest. The double ceremony was presided over by the old patriarch, who presented each couple with an 80-acre farm, complete with buildings, machinery, and stock. The eldest, Edwin, was entrusted with a third place for the youngest son, Abraham, who was still in adolescence. It was a bright future that faced the young couples. All were strong, healthy, and free of debt. Uncle Ferd dragged himself to death. Edwin, my maternal grandfather, suffering from a brain tumor, hung himself up in a smokehouse. Abe enjoyed a brief career as a rake and soldier of fortune before contracting syphilis. He came home to die. But the women did not die young. At first, they worked the land beside their men. Later, they worked the land in spite of them. When the men drank heavily or complained of aches, it was the sisters who saw that the chores were done before dawn so that the day's work could begin in earnest after breakfast. Eventually, it was the women who took the team into the fields, who hired the harvesting crew, who saw that the taxes were paid and the fences kept up and the stock bred and butchered. The men withdrew, doing much of the cooking, a little gardening, an occasional day in the fields when things were just right. They drank increasingly, complained much, and lived in constant fear and rebellion of a father who had died 20 years before, a father who shared their bed at night and who harnessed the team at dawn each day, a father who lived on in the driving ambition of his chosen daughter-in-laws. Aunt Mary never talked about the bad times to me. I picked those up from hanging around the edges of conversations. Kids usually weren't seen unless they were heard, and I learned much behind the disguise of an open book. Yet, when she talked about being young, there was a softness, a wistfulness, that belied the reality of her past so eloquently expressed in the stooped shoulders, calloused hands, and leathered purple blotched skin. She remembered the good times. The year's crops were good and prices were high. The day her team, Kit and Jeb, won the pulling contest at the county fair, with her behind them, the early years of their marriage and her and Ferd sharing each other's warmth under the goose down quilts while the Michigan winter howled outside. Now profits belong to the grocery store. Her 80 acres were only enough to keep her independent. Jeb was gone and Kit, grayed and fat, would stand at the pasture fence and whinny as Aunt Mary rumbled past on her tractor. Ferd and Mary moved to separate bedrooms long before I knew them. They talked at mealtime when Ferd was sober enough and ignored each other when he was not. Both watched his dying with the sad desperation of old lovers who had surrendered to bitterness, old friends who could no longer comfort each other. Perhaps it only seemed a pleasant place because I was indulged by both of them. I was there often and invariably on Saturday for the weekly trip into town with Aunt Mary and her old model A, the soda pop and pretzels and comic books, and the grandfather clock ticking away the still afternoons in the ancient farmhouse. I was there for the special attention, the privileges and quiet of being the only child around, for Uncle Ferd and Aunt Mary were childless. This is my second home until I was in my early teens, probably my primary home until I was six. I helped Aunt Mary with the chores, slept buried in their down quilts with heated bricks at the foot of the bed, and ate cold pork chops from a frying pan of day-hole grease and felt incredibly sorry for kids who had to live in the city. Some scenes, 
seemingly innocuous, locked into my memory circuits. Non-events of quiet and inactivity are surprisingly vivid for some reason, especially those of fall and early spring. There's a wind walking raindrops across the tin roof and a rooster crowing at the first cracks of April gray in the eastern sky. The feather bed is deep and soft and rough warm in its patched flannel sheets, and a little boy curls tighter against the chill of the cold house. It's mid-spring on the farm, but the world of work stands still for an April shower, and the old farmhouse is quiet in the luxury of sleep. The Holstein, its utter a half hour overextended, balls its discontent from the barnyard. I wish that every person could hear the rain, feel the tickle warm of nubbed flannel sheets, and even smell a spring barnyard. There's comfort in such memory for me, for anyone who was allowed a childhood. Well, thanks, Art, for that story of Aunt Mary. And now what follows is a conversation I had with Art. So I'm here with Art Zink. Welcome to Voices of the Medhow, Art. Glad to be here in the Medhow. In the Medhow. You've been here for a while. I bought the orchard in 73. I didn't live here full time until 2001. This orchard that we're on, this is just below uh, the town of Madhow. What varieties of fruit do you have here? <laughs> Actually, by virtue of single trees, I had 19 varieties of pears and 23 varieties of apples. Most of those varieties were only single trees or perhaps two or three. Wow. Basically, the commercial crop right now is Honeycrisp. There's nothing out there other than Honeycrisp that I sell. So let's talk a little bit about Aunt Mary, this story that you just told. Um, that, was a, that was a really interesting story. She was an interesting person. And so you were six years old. Uh, you're um, speaking from a six-year-old person, you know, in the story. Yeah, I, was, uh, I spent more time in that old farmhouse than I did in my own house, I think. I certainly remember more about that old farmhouse than I did in my little, the little house I was raised in for that six years. And where was that, Art? That was southeastern Michigan. Grandpa always said southeastern Michigan was the place that if the world needed an enema, southeastern Michigan would be the insertion point. <laughs> in some ways that was true, but to a child, wherever you grow up is good, I think at least in the country. So you started out in southeast Michigan then? About when I was six, uh, my father managed to buy a farm. It was nearby, just a quarter mile down the road from Aunt Mary's. Yeah, and I grew up then a quarter mile down the road to Aunt Mary's and a quarter mile up the road to my grandmother's place. And in between the two was Stony Creek. And behind Aunt Mary's, her back 20, was hardwoods. So you can imagine how I spent my years fishing in the summer when the streams dropped and of course hunting in the fall. In some ways though it's even better now. In other worries not so good. By the time I was 20 and ready to leave college there was so much sewage in the big river that came through the little town of Monroe and out into Lake Erie that you couldn't eat the fish. That's changed. Lake Erie's cleaned up. The fish are clean now. And there's more of them. On the other hand, uh, Stony Creek now is just kind of a muddy little creek. It hasn't been cleaned up for some reason. Seems environmentalists concentrate on the big things. Um, but like Lake Erie is served by these little streams, and the little streams themselves are just they're polluted terribly. And there's deer. There was no deer then. I never seen a deer or a deer track while I was a kid. But now there's deer all over the place. A yeah. lot of the small farms that went under now are just big brush patches. And so the deer move in where the cover is. You got some habitat. Habitat, that's it. That's the secret to all game management, really. Habitat. Yeah. 
Look at all my quail habitat out there. It used to be orchard. Yeah. <laughs> they yeah. love those brush piles. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, you've got a few brush piles out there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I got a question for you about frost and things like that. Have you seen a change in the, as much frost mitigation as you used to in, in you know, like 10, 15 years that ago? That wind machine hasn't been on for five years. Okay, yeah. You know, used to be, I used it every spring, sometimes three or four times. And sometimes that wasn't enough. It's definitely warmer. And in some sense, that's a good thing, like frost control. And in the winter, bad freeze is not such a threat. On the other hand, the week we're going to look at at 100 degree temperature, <laughs> that's the downside. That, yeah, that's the trade-off, huh? Yeah. Um. Well, you, you uh, bought this orchard in 73, 1973? 73, yeah. Yeah. What, what changes have you seen here, uh, Art? <laughs> <laughs> the countryside. There was no road up that mountain. There, yeah. was, there was nothing, no habitation on that mountain. Well, yeah, there's, there's a lot of change. You've, you've done a lot of work here then because I'm seeing a lot of trees here, uh, Art. Yeah. Economically, I would have been a heck of a lot better off if I just worked a second job and put the money in the stock market. But then I'd be old and crusty now. As it is, I'm just old. <laughs> yeah. Well, you said that you had a degree in botany? Botany, yeah. That was a, the science master's. And then yeah, you taught and, science for... Oh, gee. 28 years. Yeah. I'm not surprised that, that you've got an orchard here with, with that, that background, you know. I probably wasn't hard-nosed enough to really economically make the most of it. You, know, you kind of get attached to trees. You really do. Well, that's kind of like the chickens I've got, too. You get kind of attached to them, whether they're laying or not, if you know what I mean. <laughs> I mean, as far as... Yeah, what I'm hearing you say, and I'm, if I got this right, let me know, but, but it's, there's more than a dollar sign, you know, on, on, uh, uh, as far as... Um, well, I, th I think there is for anybody that lives on their farm. Okay. Yeah. There's an emotional thing there. You know, you plant the trees, you develop the trees, you harvest the trees, you see the trees die. Man, that's a part of your own life. Well, there's the investment in right there. Yeah. You know, yeah. Yep, but the orchard's been good to me. I can't, I can't complain. Well, appreciate you um, telling your story, Art, and it's nice talking with you for a little bit here. Thank you. Appreciate the opportunity to tell the story. Aunt Mary needs a little recognition now. Well said. Thanks. You've been listening to Voices of the Methow, an off-the-wall production. Until next time, thanks for listening. Yeah!